Good morning and welcome everyone. We'll let folks get settled in here and we will be starting momentarily. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome and thank you all. Um, as people are continuing to join us, I'm gonna get started with some few introductions introduction slides for you all. Thank you all for joining us for our HIV, hepatitis, and the fourth wave of the opioid epidemic, syndemics in the post-pandemic world with our presenter, Dr. Ryan Westergaard. Today's presentation is brought to you by the Great Lakes ATTC and SAMHSA. The Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are funded by SAMHSA under the following cooperative agreements. The views expressed in this webinar are the views of the speaker and do not reflect the official position of DHHS and SAMHSA. The ATTC network uses affirming language to promote the promises of recovery by advancing evidence-based and culturally informed practices. We do have a few housekeeping items for you. If you are having any technical issues, please individually message me, Alyssa Kuala, or Jen Winslow in the chat section, and we would be happy to assist you. If you are in need of uh, captions or the live transcript would be helpful, please locate the more section on your Zoom toolbar and select captions. If you do have any questions for the speaker, please put any questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen um, by locating the Q&A section in your toolbar. We will respond to questions at the end of the webinar today. You will be redirected to a very short survey at the end of the presentation. It would be greatly appreciated if you could fill that out and it should only take about two to three minutes. Certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended the full session. The recording and PowerPoint will be made available on the Great Lakes ATTC website within a week. And if you would like to stay connected with the Great Lakes ATTC, follow us on our social media. We have Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and a podcast channel, along with checking out our upcoming events on our website. And I'm super honored and excited to have our presenter, Dr. Ryan Westergaard here with us. Dr. Ryan Westergaard is a physician and epidemiologist specializing in treatment and prevention for HIV and viral hepatitis with a special dedication to harm reduction among people who inject drugs. He is currently serving as Wisconsin's chief medical officer for the Bureau of Communicable Diseases. This is in addition to his research and physician faculty position at the University of Wisconsin Madison School of Medicine and Public Health, where he's an associate professor of medicine and an infectious disease physician for UW Health. Holding these positions has paved the way for building bridges between the institutions and leverage the many resources of all to benefit the health and well-being of residents across Wisconsin. I'm super honored to pass this over to Dr. Ryan Wessergaard. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Alyssa. I'm super honored to be here. And I've been delighted to see that many of you have been already been chatting. Good uh, morning greetings and sh sharing where you're from. I see that many of you are in the Great Lakes region in the Midwest. So like I am um, probably longing for, for spring, and just when we get the sense that it's here, uh, we get more snow. So I guess there's more snow on the way to Wisconsin tonight, so we'll have to have to bear with this. But spring will be here soon, um, and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to, to share some of my work with you and talk about the topic that's really, really important to me, which is uh, controlling HIV and hepatitis C among people who use drugs. So I'll share my screen so you can see my presentation and I will get started. So these are the learning objectives for today. First, I, I want us to understand how changes in the epidemiology of opioid and methamphetamine use disorder have posed obstacles to the goals of ending the HIV epidemic. Second, I want us to recognize the potential impact of incorporating screening linkage to care and low threshold treatment for hepatitis C infection in addiction treatment settings. And this second one is a, is a point that I've really appreciated the opportunity to talk with colleagues who work in addiction medicine um, because it's, 
in addition to the very important work to do of managing and treating and supporting people with substance use disorder, there are opportunities, many unmet opportunities to also reduce their risk of uh, infectious diseases and also help meet our public health goals of eliminating HIV and hepatitis as public health threats. And then third, I wanna talk briefly about our research agenda and also share some research findings for a comprehensive patient-centered approach to health and safety for people who inject drugs. Learning objective one mentioned the a goal of ending the HIV epidemic. So if you were not aware, this has been the language that we've been using in the US at the federal and state level since about 2018, where there was a, a national goal from multiple federal agencies the, across the Department of Health and Human Services, including CDC, the NIH, and the Health Resource Services or, uh, Association, or HRSA, um, and they created a um, strategy with dedicated funding to, in addition to the already large amount of federal funding to support and respond to the HIV epidemic, try to use the tools that have been developed over the past 40 years of HIV research and treatment advances to end the epidemic or drive in new infections down to a low enough where we could no longer consider it the, the public health threat that it has been for the past. 40 years. There are four pillars for this. The first is to diagnose all people who have HIV as early as possible. Second is to treat people rapidly and effectively to, to reach sustained viral suppression, which renders them all um, non-infectious as well as prevents complications of HIV infection. Third is to prevent new HIV transmission using proven interventions, including pre-exposure prophylaxis or medicines that people take before being exposed to HIV that prevents infection, and syringe service programs, which is the piece I'm going to be talking about in my presentation, uh, which is a uh, core strategy for preventing infection among people who inject drugs. And then thirdly, the public health, or fourthly, the public health piece is to respond quickly to potential HIV outbreaks to get needed prevention and treatment services to those who need them. This is an ambitious goal, and um, it, it's a and it's um, bold and aspirational to try to reach these levels. This is a website, a, a dashboard, which the Health and Human Services Department has created with the actual indicators that they've that they've shown. The true goal, of course, is to reduce incidence, meaning we want the number of new and actual new infections to be as low as it, we can drive that down as low as we can be. Um, but of course, we can't directly measure incidents. We can only measure the people who are diagnosed. And undiagnosed HIV infection is a key driver of the epidemic. So one goal is to get as many people who are at risk tested regularly. So if they are infected, we can link them to care and prevent onward transmission. The four action areas are to, are to increase the testing through diagnosis, linkage to medical care, viral suppression, which is the, the goal of treatment, and PrEP coverage. And this website shows the, the, the goal, um, where we are in relationship to our goals. Um, unfortunately, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've lost ground in a number of these areas. And this is a snapshot of the di diagnoses showing that in 2020, the, num the amount of testing and the number of new diagnoses um, dipped as all of services for, for health and many other aspects of society were disrupted. It rebounded a bit in 2021 um, and the Preliminary data from 2022 um, are still in process, but it looks like it, new infections have, new diagnoses have gone down again. So the other main thing that's challenging our ability to end the HIV epidemic is that we've lost ground even before the pandemic in an important way. And that is, and that is the increase of substance use disorder and people who inject drugs predominantly in areas where traditional prevention services such as syringe service programs and access to testing and the services that I mentioned are necessary for the goals in the previous slide are available. So this is a, um, a, 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 a landmark publication describing a well-known outbreak in 2014 and 2015 in rural Indiana, which was a wake-up call to the field of HIV and for public health in general that whereas in the previous 30 years of the epidemic, most transmission that was associated with drug use was happening in large cities, this was the first of its kind, largest single outbreak of HIV among people who use drugs in a very small rural community. This was the report from the investigation that involved CDC, local and state health authorities, 
Um, over 200 people were diagnosed with, with HIV um, by the time that the, the, the epidemic or the outbreak was declared controlled. This shows the timeline of how when the in first person was diagnosed uh, within six months, cluster was identified, um, resources were brought to bear to, to do contact investigation and testing, um, and this shows the epidemic curve on the lower part. The way that the, the outbreak investigation led to identification of as many people as we have is a technique that we're all now familiar with having lived through COVID-19, which was contact tracing. And this was an example of how they could use case investigations and in interviews with, um, you know, in confidential settings with public health personnel to identify people who were infected, who was in their risk network, meaning people that they injected drugs with, uh, drugs with or had sex with, and it was able to characterize the epidemic in a, in a plot like this, showing the number of connections between people, the number of people who had needle sharing networks, um, people who are at the high, at the larger, the central part had multiple networks, um, and and you could see how in this densely connected small community, a rapidly spreading HIV uh, cluster could saturate the people who are at risk in this community. So as I mentioned, this was a wake up call and um, this was um, realized that this was a rural communities who were struggling with growing numbers of opioid uh, addiction and injection drug use. This was, Scott County, Indiana was not unique. CDC anticipated that this is a, a, a risk environment that would be uh, probably in many places. So they undertook a data analysis project to try to find how many and where are other communities that are um, at high risk. So they undertook, a, they developed a strategy which they now call a county level vulnerability assessment for rapid dissemination of HIV or Hep C infections among people who inject drugs. Um, and uh, to summarize that they used the a reportable condition that does exist in a nationally notifiable condition of acute hepatitis C infection, which is often diagnosed in emergency departments and hospitals when people present with symptoms of hepatitis and are found to have hepatitis C. They looked at where those cases are, are most likely, and then they also looked at other county level variables about the risk factor, the, bur the burden of infection drug use and available resources for prevention. And then they ranked the counties that have the highest vulnerability to HIV and hepatitis, created this vulnerability score. They took the top 10% of all, all, or I'm sorry, top 5% of all counties in the country and called them the most highly vulnerable. And they put them on the map, which showed that in the Appalachian region, um, southern in the you know, Rust Belt states, in certain other certain areas in, in, the, in the desert west, northern Michigan and parts of New England were shown to have highest vulnerability based on the available resources and the number of hepatitis, acute hepatitis C cases that they um, detected. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why hepatitis C diagnosis is so important for HIV prevention a little, a little bit later. Um, another piece that got a lot of attention in this Scott County outbreak was not only where, what counties are available, but what are the structural barriers to implementing the things we know are valuable and beneficial for preventing HIV. And syringe service programs in particular, which are usually community-based organizations, low threshold anonymous um, services where people can get uh, sterile injection equipment, but also get testing for HIV and hepatitis C and linkage to resources that can help them get linked to treatment when they're ready and other social services that they need. So this is an evidence-based strategy for HIV prevention. The data have, have clearly shown that it does not increase uh, the drug use. In fact, it, people who use inject syringe service programs have been, found, have been found to be more likely to enter addiction services by virtue of the system navigation and support that people receive when they release their services in these um, community-based settings. So this paper showed those same vault counties, and, but then color-coded them, which in terms of the, which are the ones that have no uh, SEP or syringe exchange program. Many of them prefer the term syringe service programs rather than exchange. And it showed considerable overlap. So the red counties here are ones where there were 
no or zero syringe service programs in the county that was determined to be high risk. Um, and so as one would predict, areas that lack these services and had high risk for HIV and transmission um, were going to be likely ones that had the next HIV outbreaks. And um, sure enough, several years later, there were two outbreaks that were large enough to, to warrant a federal or CDC level investigation that were published both in West Virginia. Um, this is one in Cable, Cable County, which actually did have had a, a, a more robust public health system compared to most counties in, in, in West Virginia, but showed the, you know, the degree of risky behavior that was happening, even in that setting where testing was more available in most places in West Virginia. Um, and the story about political and social and structural barriers to prevention really played out in West Virginia as well. So this was an international um, uh, reporting piece about the other uh, HIV cluster which occurred in Kanawha County, which um, shut down you know, because of political opposition, shut down its syringe service program in March 2018, and within a year had another HIV transmission cluster that was investigated by, by CDC. This is a summary, a, a, a study showing across 14 uh, or 15 West Virginia counties, showing that in addition to these discrete clusters over these three years, the number of cases of HIV have been gradually growing um, year after year. So I, I had the, the pleasure to, to present a, a webinar to the, in the same forum for ATTC um, about three years ago. It was before, it was before the, the pandemic. And I talked about some research findings or a research project that my team at the University of Wisconsin is in, involved with that was set up in response to these rural, these, the risk of um, HIV outbreaks in rural communities across Wisconsin. Um, as I, I promised, I was said, if you'd have me back, I would present some of the findings of that research project. And so that's what I'm going to do now in this next part of the, the presentation. Um, the, for background, the Rural Opioid Initiative Research Consortium is, is an NIH-funded network of eight studies that started um, in 2016, 2017. And the, these are the three goals for this research network. The first was to build local collaborations, aggregate existing data, and conduct a rapid epidemiological assessment to fill in local gaps and harmonize core data elements across studies. So these was the, the first phase of the study, which was underway the last time that I was able to speak with the ATTC group. Um, and in Wisconsin, which was one of the sites that was funded, we were working with a syringe service program called Vivent Health, and, and our goal was to recruit about a thousand people, a thousand of their clients and people in the inject and drug use networks of their clients to understand more about the types of services they access, the types of um, drug use behaviors that they're engaged with, and who is at the greatest risk for HIV and viral hepatitis. Um, the second goal of the Research Rural Opioid Initiative was to propose locally relevant intervention projects informed by the UG three phase collaborations and assessments. Um, in Wisconsin, with that the, the shape that that took was in a um, in person one on one coaching intervention, which we called prevention navigation, which was modeled after a CDC funded study called Project Start, which was shown to be effective to reduce HIV. We adapted it for the use and now have deployed and trained and deployed um, uh, health coaches, which we call prevention navigators within syringe service programs to help people do better to ex to access services that they can benefit from, including Medicaid or other health insurance, addiction treatment when they're ready for it, um, and uh, give them education about reducing their risk. And then the third is to implement sustainable local ta locally tailored interventions over a period of years. So these were the sites that were funded under the Rural Opioid Initiative. Um, it, there's a fair amount of overlap with that county level vulnerability. Most of the, many of the studies were in the uh, St. You know, Ohio River Valley Appalachian region. The other was in uh, New England and one on the West Coast in Oregon. And the investigation investigator teams from all of these eight studies work very closely together to collect data through surveys of people who use 
opioids and other drugs in a harmonized way so we could pool the data and answer questions that no single study would have the power to do. Um, the data collection that I'm going to be talking about from this first phase of the study, the, not the intervention phase, but the, um, the, the survey phase, the formative phase, and that happened both, that, that included both quantitative and qualitative data. We did uh, a survey, or ACASI stands for Audio Computer Assisted Self Interview. So uh, uh, surveys on an iPad where they listen to the, the questions in a, in, a, a non, in a confidential way, a private setting where they talk about sensitive behaviors and, and other risk factors. We also had implemented something called recruitment via respondent driven sampling. This was important because we wanted to um, uh, understand the risk behaviors of not only people who came into the syringe service programs, but people who are in their social networks who may not come in. So we incentivize people to recruit other people from their social network um, who may or may not use harm reduction services so we could understand the, the more the, the true prevalence of the, some of the factors we were interested in. There were also qualitative findings. We did key, key informant interviews with people in law enforcement, in, in human service agencies, in medical settings to understand how are the healthcare needs of the, this population met in these communities and also did in-depth interviews with people who use drugs. Finally, there was a laboratory component where everyone who was in, enrolled in the study underwent rapid testing for HIV, hepatitis C, and syphilis. And um, an innovative part that our group in Wisconsin was, was uh, um, one of the leaders on was um, labor uh, innovative laboratory technology called next generation sequencing, where of specimens that tested positive for hepatitis C virus, they did um, genomic sequencing to understand the uh, genetic characteristics or the genetic code of the virus. And that enables people to look for transmission clusters to see where um, uh, clusters of genetically similar virus had been spreading, which can indicate that there is more active recent transmission of hepatitis C. So in this next time, I'm going to talk about some publications um, from the, the network that I thought that you might find interesting, and it provides an example of the kinds of things we're learning when we do re research in partnership with communities um, among a population that's been traditionally pretty difficult to engage in services as well as research. So the, the findings, um, number one, are going to be about the, um, the, the, the issue that while this was called the Rural Opioid Initiative, we found probably more stimulant use than opioid use in many of the communities. And that um, has significant implications for treatment, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, specific challenges for disease prevention. Um, and I think we identified this at a larger level than was anticipated, at least by the funding agencies. The, the second uh, finding um, across most, in all of the studies, we strong, found strong levels of stigmatization. People don't use services because they feel unwelcome, they feel stigmatized. Um, and this contributes to a concept that some of our collaborators define the rural risk environment meaning the many different factors that increases the risk, not strictly at the individual level, but at the, at the community level and at the societal and legal level. Um, third, I wanna share a study about uh, the transition to injection drug use. Some studies um, like ours exclusively enrolled people with who injected drugs. And um, most of the studies had a substantial number of people who used injection drug use and there was some investigation into at what point in the life course or the illness course or addiction addiction life course of a person do they transition from using drugs from non-injection route to your injection route. We also had a, a study about internet and phone access and how critical that is for treatment access in rural communities and a few you know interesting or unexpected drug use behaviors uh, the case of, of wasp dope, which maybe you have heard about, but it was a new one for me. Okay, so I'll get into these few studies and just uh, share some, some screenshots of the, the major figures and talk about some of the lessons that were learned from these studies. Um, the title of my talk, I used this phrase, the fourth wave of the opioid epidemic, and that was um, something that was also came out of this, this main cohort description paper. You know, there's b before, uh, before 2017, when the study was, uh, these studies were launched to some people describe the opioid epidemic as having three waves. The first, of course, being um, overprescription, overuse of prescription opioids, followed by a transition to heroin use in many communities, and then the rise of illicit um, fentanyls. 
Um, the fourth wave, as, as we'll, we'll show, is, is char characterized by uh, a continuing or growing um, prominence of, of fentanyls, but also concurrent use with stimulants and methamphetamines and increased number of overdose related deaths in which stimulants like methamphetamine and cocaine are used. And we have uh, found some interesting uh, data that provides context to that. And so that's uh, what the authors called this the, the fourth wave of the opioid crisis. And this is from that first cohort description paper. This, this shows all the eight sites, um, the number of people who were recruited at, at eight sites. Um, here in Wisconsin, we had quite a few more because I think we were working with this established or in service program um, where they had good relationships with communities and people came in and were eager to participate in research. So we, we got just under just under a thousand people uh, who had a past 30 day history of injecting drugs. Um, the, the two rows that I highlighted here were responses to the question of what is your preferred drug or your drug of choice for getting high. And first of all, not shown on this is that uh, poly substance use, use of multiple substances was, was definitely the norm. But people, when you ask them, what's your preferred drug? Um, heroin, which was anticipated to be the highest was, was actually the minority. Methamphetamine was the drug of choice by most people overall in the study. And there was significant variation. So in New England, it was, it was not. So in New England, 60% of people said heroin was their drug of choice. And in, in uh, Oregon, it, in Wisconsin, 52% that methamphetamine was their drug of choice. So there's geographic variability in this. And in, at the time, even when we asked people about fent access to fentanyl, uh, a small number of people said that it was their drug of choice, um, even if, uh, which I think has probably evolved since the study was, was launched, as I'm sure you've, you are aware of as well. Um, so the, um, the, one of the first major papers about this uh, concurrent opioid and methamphetamine use came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, apparently, it was led by the it was led by the group from Oregon, but it was uh, using the multi-site data. And uh, this figure shows the probability of methamphetamine overdose in the last 180 days, and um, it shows that the the probability of of a non-fatal overdose. Um, if someone reported methamphetamine use was five percent of the of the pooled sample, but people that used concurrent opioids and, and methamphetamine had a substantially higher risk of, of overdose, both in the past 80 days and over their lifetime. Um, the, the team from Oregon also um, was in a, in a unique place because they were starting to do their surveys and interviews right at a time where in those communities, um, fentanyl was becoming more and more recognized as a major a contributor to drug overdose and the, um, the the general mix of substances that were used by a pop, by the population and to use drugs, and this is an example of the qualitative work that was done, um, where most of the sites did some in depth interviews with uh, with people who also conduct surveys, usually a subset, and ask them a range of questions about the drugs that they're encountering, what's drug use like in their community. And, uh, and this was a, a paper that described the rapid recognition or the, the, the recognition of the rapid increase in the, the fentanyl in Oregon. This quote says that a lot of people who were never into opiates were just 100% methamphetamine users, don't really like methamphetamine now. They hardly ever do meth. It's all about the fetties and fentanyl pills. And more and more people, especially young people, and a quote from a different participant said that the younger population is probably in trouble because um, fentanyl is just starting to get hot and popular and the younger generation is, is influenced by coolness or, or whatever. So um, even though on the table I showed, very few people are, were said that fentanyl was their drug of choice, there was some qualitative findings that said that that is a growing issue that some people are seeking out, seeking out fentanyl. So this next paper um, is also a, a qualitative, qualitative uh, study that used um, not only interviews with people who use drugs and uh, local stakeholders and the in service communities, but, um, but also data, epidemiologic data and data that they got from doing, uh, looking at um, community level economic indicators, for example. And uh, so they, they 
we're specifically focused on hepatitis C in Appalachian, Kentucky. And um, these were their main findings. You know, a barren job market, diminished formal opportunities for social enrichment and stigma were the macro level features of the social and economic environment that shaped drug use for young adults. And here was one, one quote that was, you know, if, if jobs could be found around here, it wouldn't be that bad. We wouldn't have depression that people are trying to fix with the drugs. Um, and, and a lot of you know, a, a lot of descriptions just of general despair. There used this used to be a vibrant community with things to do if you were young, and now it's social economically depressed. There's little there's little else things to do. People are feeling hopeless and turning to drugs for for coping. And that those those things contribute both both the individual level risk factors for an increasing number of people who have a use disorder and physical dependence, but also the community level indicators that um, that contribute to a overall sense of hopelessness. And they, when they synthesized all the things that they learned, they, they identified factors in the in rural communities that contribute to a risk for um, hepatitis C, particularly for this paper, but also for HIV access. And um, they put them into the, these several buckets of economic, social, uh, physical risk factors, law enforcement, and, and healthcare. And here at this, the center are the individual level things. So people don't have access to sterile syringes. They are they have to pool resources to buy drugs. So they're using with other with other people. There's um, uh, generally you know behaviors occur in the shadows, and sharing syringes and other epidemic and other equipment is the most proximal risk factor for, for transmitting. Hepatitis C. So it was a nice, I thought, comprehensive evaluate or picture of the of the environment that contributes to the spread of HIV and hepatitis in these communities, and really shows the degree to which we have our work cut out for us if we want to turn turn the the tide against you know the risk for these infections. So I mentioned that most of the studies did both qualitative and quantitative research. Um, and this is an example of uh, actually really an excellent example of mixed methods research, where um, not only are we collecting both quantitative data from survey responses, where we ask people to recount how many times did you do X, Y, or Z, and then qualitative questions where some of the quotes that I mentioned, but they integrate them in a novel way where the qualitative data adds context um, and a perspective around the quantitative findings um, in a really novel way. So it's there, it really shows the synergy between these two research methods. And this study in particular, their, their specific question was um, injection to, or initiation and transition to injection drug use among people who didn't. So the quantitative piece was they asked of, of the people who reported injecting drugs, they said, well, at what age did was the first time that you injected? And they created this curve um, that by, um, that almost everyone by, by age 60, but about by about 50% of the time it was by age 20 in a, in a range there. So, um, and then they showed that yeah, of people who injected at various age, age ranges, younger at 16 or older at 25, um, they looked to the qual quantitative data and said, well, when, when we talked to those people who had who injected at those times, what did they tell us about? What was, you know, what was going on? Um, and, 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 and they just put a couple of, uh, anecdotes here, but then um, summarized the findings for people in these in these different age categories and made this conceptual model similar to the rural risk environment. And they found you know a, a number of things. So one was that the normalization of drug use within families and communities. In these communities, sometimes multiple people in the same household were injecting drugs, and when one person starts to um, starts to inject drugs, they have access. They can they um, you know the, the behaviors tend to to spread among people in within in close social networks. Um, another one, another issue that they found was was trauma. So people who had um, traumatic life events had um, a uh, an increased risk of transitioning to uh, injection drug use or addiction severity became became worse. Um, and that's seen as a as a antecedent or a risk factor for injecting. 
And then uh, other is the abrupt discontinuation of prescription opioids as, uh, as a cause of transition to injection drug use. And um, I won't read all of these uh, all of these quotes, but I'd be we're happy to post these on on the ATTC website so you can you can look about at these stories at your convenience. Okay, here was a, st um, uh, a study more 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 simple and straightforward method. It was just an analysis of the cross-sectional survey data that I found interesting because of some other work that we've done and some um, uh, ideas about how to improve access to treatment through either mobile health apps or through telehealth um, in order for a lot of the advances in mobile health that we've um, that we've developed particularly during the pandemic uh, a lot of these promising strategies rely, rely on or necessitate that someone has access to a device and so this was a study to say well what is the current landscape what is the prevalence of people who have um, more or less access to the technology that would be needed for some of these things. Um, and I believe the overall rate of smartphone use among adolescents and adults in the US is, is 95, over 95% um, is, the, is the norm. Among the samples of the people in this study, 35% had no, uh, so they did not have a cell phone. This is to say they don't have access to a phone. We hear a lot of people who are sharing phones among multiple people. And 10% uh, of, of people had, you didn't use the internet in any in any fashion in the previous 30 days. So this is um, you know certainly shows a a gap. And this table on the left shows that among people who had a lower phone and internet access, they were actually less likely to receive um, medications for opioid use disorder or to receive counseling for for addiction. So um, the higher, you know, so people who had, um, yeah, down at the at the bottom left, so no cell phone or internet, you know, were about forty percent lower odds of receiving any counseling than people that had um, phone or internet. So it shows a risk factor that um, we probably hadn't thought about as a barrier to accessing treatment, um, and calls for different kinds of interventions. So this was a study that was limited to our group in Wisconsin. Um, all the sites did a harmonized study, but site, but the studies were welcome to add additional questions. So we did a smaller, a small, a sub study um, because a student that we um, had on our team was interested in, in in this topic. So factors associated with skin and soft tissue infections. Uh, uh, among people. So we, we did, we rolled out this supplemental survey for a number of people um, about what are the risk factors for, for people who develop skin and soft tissue infections, found some, some interesting things. So, so probably not, ex, not expected people who would have to inject multiple time or mul make multiple attempts to inject to find a vein, probably a marker that they've been injecting for a long time, that their skin has been damaged. Um, and the more times you inject, the more chance you have to introduce bacteria. People inject into muscle, probably the same thing. That was the strongest risk factor, 17% uh, or 17 times greater odds of a skin and soft tissue infection if someone said they had to inject into their muscle rather than the vein, skin popping similarly. Um, but uh, for reasons that we uh, I don't think fully understand, um, there was a strong gender association where female uh, participants in the study had three times greater odds of having a skin and soft tissue infection um, than, than male participants. So something that probably deserves more work. Um, there may be confounded by, by some of these um, things and uh, something we probably need to learn more about what, what's, what are the mechanisms for that increased risk. Okay, and this is the fast, this is the um, unusual uh, finding that I, I mentioned at the beginning, I just wanted to share. I, I don't think, and I certainly hope this is not something that, that, takes, that, that takes off, but, um, they, our colleagues in Kentucky heard through their qualitative interviews of people using something called wasp dope. And what wasp dope is, is um, a crystallized version, a crystallized form of the uh, pyrethrins that are in wasp killer. So as I understand it, they take this, the uh, wasp killer spray, they spray it on a metal screen, they electrify the screen, and then it desiccates and is left with this crystal. And um, it's unclear whether this was, you know, supposed to be a form of uh, uh, 
a, a simulant or it got passed off or something that looks like methamphetamine. Um, but the, the anecdotally, people say that it causes a causes a high. It's a the toxicology paper uh, about this showed that it does have some. These pyrethrins have uh, sympathomimetic, so it causes a it causes uh, increased heart rate, and um, so might be might be used for people who are are desperate and don't have access to other other drugs. Um, so an uh, interesting finding. So if you hear about wasp dope in the, here in the Midwest, you've there are some resources from Kentucky about where, what that means and what that looks like. The last, the last thing I wanted to, to, to talk about in this last section is getting back to um, this idea of transmission clusters and talking in a little bit more detail about the genomic sequencing and how that can be useful and what that can teach us. So this was a, a, a paper across the entire network one of the elements of the Rural Opioid Research Consortium was to um, share residual blood specimens that, from patients who had hepatitis C with a, a laboratory in Massachusetts that did next generation sequencing. And how it works is that if you find sequences of the virus, of the, the, the RNA, that are similar enough um, because we know the rate at which hepatitis C generally mutates, if they're very similar, that means there's a recent transmission. And so having studied this and created models, they have a, a genetic distance metric where they can they have a threshold and they say, well, if these are similar enough, we consider them a cluster. And so of um, in Wisconsin, we, we sent all of the specimens there. We also had re residual leftover specimens at our state public health laboratory that had been tested for people who are in um, tested in public health settings like certain service programs and also jails and prisons. And we shared these anonymized residual specimens with the same laboratory and were able to write this paper that when, when you do this, we, we actually can indeed find cl um, clustering, uh, most of which were dyads, but some larger clusters, um, even if we don't uh, sequence a high proportion of the population. So, so that was um, kind of a methods paper. And the, the reason that's important and how that is, is relevant um, to some ways we could use novel tools in the future uh, gets back to something that was learned through the Scott County, Indiana outbreak. So this is from the same paper I shared at the very beginning about the Scott County, Indiana. And when, and when they did the similar genetic sequencing of the HIV virus, not hepatitis C, they found um, Something very interesting, but probably not surprising when we when we overlay it with the, what we learned from the epidemiologic investigation, and is that it was essentially all the cases of HIV were one cluster. So this was a group, this was a community that had a high level of injection drug use, a high level of syringe sharing, as we saw in that network diagram, and then at one point the HIV virus was introduced and it spread very rapidly. The result of that was that here 157 out of the 159 cases that had the sequencing done were all part of the same cluster. There were two that were not part of the same cluster. And the other dark, black dots in, this, in, the, in the red circles on, on this side were other cases that were, that were from, from Indiana that were from the past several years showing no relationship. So uh, the message here is that this was essentially a, a, a single introduction um, that caused this rapid spread. So this is a different paper, but you, the same idea about the same community on the specimens that were collected from the, the patients in, in Scott County that were um, test sequenced for hepatitis C. And, and the, the lesson was very different. So there were 181 cases in Scott County. Um, oh, sorry, the first bullet says of the HIV cases in Scott County, 90% also had hepatitis C. So that we we call this a HIV outbreak, but it was an HIV and hepatitis C outbreak. Almost almost everyone was co-infected. Um, when they did the sequencing, rather than a single cluster of H of uh, of, in, in, of similar viruses that we saw in the HIV side, there were 23 distinct genetic clusters, some of which were just clusters of two or three people. Um, so clearly there had there was recently spreading, but the message from this was that. Um, hepatitis C had been spreading for some time. And if we could look back and if we were able to detect hepatitis C earlier, we could have been, we could have recognized that this was a high risk environment for, for rapid spread of HIV because we knew that there was 
a lot of clustering, uh, a lot of transmission happening. And so this is a this is a, a um, an, an analysis that sort of told that told that story. Um, it's a takes a little bit of orientation. So I'll say this top graph here, the blue line is the cumulative diagnosis. So this is the number of people again from the same dynamic, the same the, the same uh, outbreak in Scott County. Um, showed like how quickly when, once the first case was detected, the investigation started. They found almost 200 other cases within a few months um, through the, the contact tracing, the scale up of testing, in the in the local and federal support that they got for for having tests. Um, the gray area here is was, was working backwards. Given what we know about how long um, people have been infected, and um, which we can do by CD4 count and other other parameters. Um, this was their the modeling results for when they thought the actual infections happened. So what when was the actual incidence? When were people infected? And this, of course, you know, goes back several years. Obviously, there was a time where transition really took off. But if you're going back, there were probably some people who were in, who were infected for a year, um, a year or more. And the, the outcomes or the, the message of this study, which had a you know, significant editorial component, is that if we had done routine testing, Let's say we would have detected the first couple of cases in January of 2013 com compared to 2015 when the first diagnosis was, was made. Um, they estimated they could have prevented 85% you know, of the, you know, if, if all of this work here had happened a few years earlier by more testing, we could have prevented this many, 85% uh, of the infections. And then the next step um, if, if, is that when we look back and you did the same thing with hepatitis C, um, had we been testing routinely, we could have detect, detected uh, the, the, the start of hepatitis C cases as far back as 2010. So all these tools that are, that are listed on this side of the slide, syringe exchange program, HIV clinics, investigating, um, linking people to care, like we've known about those things for decades. Those are tools that are, are, that are in existence everywhere. If we could have used them um, four years earlier in this community, we could have prevented this outbreak altogether. So that's the, that I think speaks to the power of these simple tools that we need to implement better if we're going to um, you know, solve these, these epidemics. So uh, my very first slide started, I talked about the national ending the HIV viral HIV epidemic uh, plan. There is also a national viral hepatitis strategic plan. The World Health Organization in 2016 um, created a, a document say, declaring a, a global health goal of ending the hepatitis C or ending viral hepatitis as a, as a public health crisis by 2030. CDC followed suit and has published uh, a framework to eliminate viral hepatitis as a public health threat by, by 2030. And, and these are the five goals, which will be sound very similar to the way that we uh, approach HIV, which is to prevent new infections, improve treatment outcomes for people who do have viral hepatitis, reduce health disparities and health inequities, improve surveillance and data usage, and achieve integrated coordinated efforts that address the viral hepatitis among all partners. Um, this, is the this is the pathway. Is that this is the, essentially the tool that we need to figure out how to implement. Um, and it's, it's very analogous to HIV, except for the fact that we actually cure people of hepatitis C. So the, the the resources that have to be in place are able to find people with chronic hep C. Once they're diagnosed, link them to care. When they're in care, they need to be treated. And these days, treatment results in cure more than 90% of the time. And it's short, it's a single pill daily. Um, it's very, it's become very easy. It's very different than if we were to have this conversation 10 years ago where hepatitis C treatment required interferon, um, we would not be in the same place. These days we can cure someone with hepatitis C in eight weeks with therapy that's very easily tolerated. Um, this is something I think everyone should know that the US Preventive Services Task Force recommends screening for hepatitis C in all adolescents and adults at least once. So this was a few years ago um, after looking at data. They looked at the same question three, several years before this. I don't remember exactly when, but 2010 or, or before. Um, and they concluded there was not sufficient evidence to recommend screening for everyone for hepatitis C. It was only recommended to, be, to screen people who have risk factors um, and, and people who were in the baby boomer cohort because there was a lot, they knew there was a lot of, a lot of undiagnosed infection. So, so this, 
study and you can go to this website and see all the data that they resolved but it was a it was a, a a pretty rigorous process to say you know does the evidence support that doing this is going to be cost you know cost beneficial at, at the, the usual standards and the answer was that it was so they recommend one time screening for most adults um, and periodically screen persons with continued risk factors such as people with past or current injection drug use. Um, they don't know, you know, say there's limited evidence from how frequently, operationally, we say you, about every six months if people are, are at risk, but if people are at risk in part of a, a known cluster, doing more than that might actually make sense. So there is a, you know, a, a, a federal guideline, a recommendation to screen every adult with hepatitis C. There's also national recommendations to treat every person with chronic, infect, with chronic infection. And so this is a joint statement by the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases and the Infectious Disease Society of America using a similar process, reviewing, the da reviewing all the data about the risks benefits of treatment and the likely outcome if we scale this up both on, on the, the risk of liver disease, morbidity and mortality and on the ep epidemic. And uh, this was their one ready, you know, level 1A recommendations that treatment is recommended for all patients with chronic hep C, except those with a short life expectancy that can't be remedied by hepatitis C therapy or liver transplantation or other directed therapy. So essentially people who are on palliative care or, or, or hospice for whom this would not improve their quantity or quality of life, everyone with chronic hep C should be treated according to these, these guidelines. So this, the, the bad news is we've, we've known about these for a while, the data have, have been in, and we're not implementing this well as a system in, you know, in this country. There are countries who are treating everyone, you know, Egypt, for example. Egypt and Iceland and the Republic of Georgia have national hepatitis elimination strategies that result, that have encouraged or, or have free treatment for everyone who's, who's tested. Um, those are lower, much lower resource countries than, than we are, and they're doing it. This is a study that uh, from from last winter or no last last summer that showed um, when we looked at large data large claims data sets from insurance and these are people who are insured who are in a medical setting who, and got diagnosed how many people were treated for hepatitis C according you know as is recommended within one year um, and it's uh, there's no group where a majority is being treated it gets better as you get older people in the age of 50 to 50 to 60, um, about 40% were treated if you had private insurance, but still only about a quarter if, if they had Medicaid. Um, and there's racial disparities um, uh, as well, meaning that people who have Medicaid or private insurance, um, there's, um, um, are not being treated at the levels that we require. Medicaid is, a, is an important thing to understand. Um, it showed here that Medicaid participants are being treated less frequently. But it really has been the focus of a lot of policy innovation to try to improve treatment access among Medicaid specifically. That Medicaid, of course, is as where I sit in government public health, kind of the one policy, the one set of policies that we actually are able to influence at a governmental level because they're run by state health departments and they get federal and state funding. And so over the um, over the past ten years, when we've during the, what I would call the treatment revolution, where we've developed directly acting antiviral uh, treatment that's highly effective, um, most states initially put um, put a, the, the brakes on treating people because it was so expensive. And then, as time has gone on, advocates sometimes be, sometimes lawsuits have have um, undone these restrictions on the grounds that they were discriminatory. For example, there are some set, some states that said if you are a person who has a substance use disorder. Um, unless you've been in remission for a year, we won't treat you. So that's um, technically illegal because they're, they deserve treatment as well as anyone else. Furthermore, the data suggests that if you treat people, even if there are injection drug, if they are actively injecting drug use, they get cured just as well. Um, so in Wisconsin, we, we focused a lot on this. We actually removed all of our restrictions. Um, and, and there's this uh, um, National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable, which creates a map. You can go to this website and see how your state uh, matches up. Um, we're one of a handful of states in Wisconsin that, that gets an A plus because not only did we review all the restrictions, um, such as you need to be treated by a, a, a gastroenterologist, um, you have to have uh, sobriety for a certain amount of time, um, 
we've gotten rid of all those, but we also removed prior authorization, which we learned was a huge barrier for um, providers to actually treat hepatitis C is all the all the all the paperwork. So at least in Medicaid, if you use one of the preferred treatments, um, they can just prescribe without prior authorization. Okay, so this is this is my my last slide, and um, I want to save a couple of minutes for questions. But um, I, I hope I made the the case that um, treating hepatitis C and HIV, testing people to find out whether they're infected, linking them to care is is important. Um, it's also, I don't have time to go through this, but it's also actually really easy to do these things. There are point of care tests, you can do finger sticks tests in, in a lot of settings, um, and treatment for hepatitis C can be done via a, a protocol now that um, can be done over telemedicine or with minimal provider oversight. So it truly is an, an easy thing to cure someone of hepatitis C. So what's, gonna, what's, what's it gonna take for us to actually in these epidemics? It's gonna be, we have to do these things more often and in more places where they traditionally haven't been done. Um, and I think addiction medicine, addiction treatment settings are going to be a really important partner to do this. And I, I love this picture. This is um, because this is an example of the way we need to think about curing hep C, which is there are patients, honestly, the patients at the greatest risk who um, aren't going to come to us. They're not going to come to uh, UW Health, for example. Um, uh, unless they're have an emergency or they're very sick. So if, we, if we're serious around um, reducing transmission, we got to take the treatment to them, and it's absolutely feasible to do so. And this is a this is a van um, affiliated with San Francisco General Hospital, which goes out and tests people, um, and then gives them the treatment right in the van, and they never have to they never have to see um, you know go into a clinic or or a hospital. Um, they built the trust of the community by doing this, and um, and their you know the system works. Um, the intervention studies that are part of our rural opioid network, two of the sites, one in Oregon and one of in, in Massachusetts, uh, are, are actually implementing the same model of collecting data, doing a clinical trial of usual care, which is referring someone to a clinic where they probably have a lot of barriers um, versus just treating them where, they are, where, they're, where they're at. Um, I anticipate those studies are going to tell us the story that this is a really good strategy. And, uh, maybe for a future webinar for this group when they get when they get their data to come and talk about how we can create screening and linkage to care in these other settings. So um, I uh, I've got a couple minutes left. I'll um, I'll stop there. And um, if there's a, a couple of questions. I'll be happy to answer them. But since we don't have much time, I'm also happy to be uh, contacted with any questions or comments or um, ideas for how to do this work better or ideas for collaboration, if you want to um, email me here at this um, at this address. So thank you again to uh, Alyssa and your team for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Rustergaard. I just put um, your email in the chat for folks to reference. Right now, we don't have any questions in our Q&A box. Um, you provided such a great um, detailed, data-driven presentation. So we're all very, very happy that you were able to be here and share all of that with us. Um, for folks, before you go, um, just a few reminders. You will be redirected to a very short survey at the end of this presentation. Um, and we would greatly appreciate it if you could fill out that survey for us. Uh, certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended the full one hour session. Um, the recording and the PowerPoint will also be made available on the Great Lakes ATTC website within a week. So you can um, check that out um, on our website. Please, again, please allow up to one week to um, download and get that recording up there for you. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we have a lot of a lot of thanks in the chat for you, Dr. Westergaard. Um, very great and interesting, great explanation. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for joining us on this lovely Friday morning. And we hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. All right. Bye, bye all.